Welcome to the morning service of First United Methodist Church of Starkville, the church in the heart of the town with Christ in the heart of the church. Our weekly Sunday services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. and our evening service is at 6 p.m. Join us now as we come together and exalt Jesus Christ our Lord. This the Lord's house on this the Lord's day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's wonderful that we can all be gathered here together at First United Methodist Church to worship God and to be in this warm fellowship. So we want to offer a, a special welcome to all of you visiting with us today and ask that everybody take a few moments and sign the friendship registers located in the pews near you and pass those down and get to know those sitting around you at this time. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, we hope that you'll come back Wednesday a little after noon for uh, our Lenten services that we're having. We have a bit of scripture and some reflection, and we share in the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It's a very special time, so we hope you'll come join us in the chapel downstairs. Also, there will be no Wednesday night activities this week except for choir. So there you have it. Also, March 31st, the Startville District will do its part to support Stop Hunger Now, a conference-supported international ministry. And we want to also give a big thanks to everyone who's provided food and support for the Habitat teams who've been in over the past couple of weeks. Thank you for that. We also offer our sympathies to Ms. Marilyn Thompson in the death of her mother, Mrs. Velma Burney. Would you please stand and join with me in the call to worship? O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Let us pray. O oh God, we call upon you this morning and every morning to be our strength and our salvation. Come and be with us and renew us with your life-giving spirit. We need you so. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us, is numbered 381 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas, please.
standing and join with me on page 881 in the historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And at this time, we'd like to invite Jennifer and Lance forward to present their baby for baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. And to the parents, I ask you on behalf of the church, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord? And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? And what name is given this child? Huh? Pharaoh Elizabeth, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh. Amen. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for this child, for her parents, for her grandparents, and all those who love her. We thank you for this church, and we just pray that this church and any church that she shall be a part of in coming days will guide her and teach her the ways of Jesus Christ so that she can make that decision in the future for herself. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Congregation, would you stand and join with me in the pledge on page 44? 
Members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care Farah Elizabeth, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that she may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ, that Farah Elizabeth, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Please be seated. Let us pray. O God of all creation, the days grow warmer as we enter the embrace of spring and the beauty of the earth is blossoming. We celebrate the rich array of colors bursting forth all around us. And just as the flowers and trees need water and sun, we need your grace and your sun. You constantly pour out your grace and love on us in hopes that we too would grow into the people you created us to be. We pray, O oh God, that the growth you are cultivating in our hearts can be seen in the ways we treat your creation. Let us turn our faces towards you and drink in your love and encouragement so that we might be more loving and encouraging to those around us, that we might be better stewards of the resources you have blessed us with. Imagine the growth of your creation, humanity, if all served out of your love and truly tried to love others as you love us. We know this dream of love can come true, for you planted the seed of your dream in your churches. But we need your help. If it were up to us, we would just plant our own seeds of prosperity and prestige, rather than water and nurture your seeds of compassion and care. You created us and connected our lives to each other, and you are what holds us together. So forgive us when we choose to plant our selfish seeds and pour your forgiveness down on the dry and parched landscapes we have created in our hearts. Let your loving grace flow over the scorched wounds of our lives and let your strength fill our weak spots so that we might continue growing into people who reflect your image that is in each one of us. And as we have surrounded this precious baby with our love and promised to help raise her in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, Surround each one of us with your steadfast love so that we will continue growing in our faith. Let our baptismal vows be seen in our words and actions as we grow into the people you would have us to be. And it is as your people, your beloved community of faith, that we pray the prayer Jesus taught us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now if the children will come join Miss Jane at the altar. Last time we were together down here, we started making a mobile. Were you here and remember those of you who were here that week? And we added these baby booties because we talked about how a baby and little children depend on their parents for everything they need. They can't do anything for themselves. They, they need their parents to do things for them, don't they? So we added these baby booties as a way to remind us that God wants us to depend on Him just like that. All right, this morning I brought an umbrella and we're adding, can you tell what these are? Boots. Boots. What kind of boots? Rain, rain. rain boots to the mobile. And I have this umbrella, so what do you think we're going to be talking about down here today? Rain. rain. Think of a Bible story that has a lot of rain in it. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. That's right. This morning at 8.30, someone thought of another one that I hadn't thought of. So it shows that a lot of times y'all are smarter than I am. That was the one they thought of, the big storm. That's right, with Jesus and the disciples. But this morning we are going to talk about Noah. Do you remember that God was really sad 
with the world. There was so much sin in the world. Noah and his family were the only ones who loved God and who did what God wanted them to do. So God told Noah to do what? Build an ark. ark. An ark was a big, big boat. And not only did God tell Noah to build this boat, he told him exactly what kind of wood to build it from. And he told him how wide to make it and how tall to make it. He told him exactly what he wanted to do. Did Noah do it? He surely did. Noah started building that ark. And it took him a long time. You want to come up here and sit with me? He did. He and his sons, I think, it took him a long, long time to build that ark. And even though it wasn't raining yet, and I bet there weren't even dark clouds in the sky, Noah was still building that ark. Noah did what God said, didn't he? And then when it was finished, he and his sons and their wives and his wife got on the ark with all the animals, and then it started raining. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and all the earth was destroyed. But Noah and his family and all those animals were safe because Noah obeyed God, didn't he? Even when it didn't seem like it was making a lot of sense, Noah did what God asked him to do. And that's what God wants us to do. And that's why we added these boots to the mobile to remind us, first of all, when we depend on God for everything, God will help us know what to do so that we can obey him. So this reminds us to depend on God, and the rain boots remind us to obey God like Noah did. Will you pray with me? Thank you so much, God, for the stories for the things we learn from people like Noah. God, help us to always follow you, to depend on you first of all, so that we'll know what you want us to do, and then to obey you when we realize what you're telling us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're four or if you're in kindergarten. So that I will be in the good graces of the congregation, I must explain the chancel choir gets their spring break after Easter because we have so much music to prepare for Holy Week and Easter. So rest assured, they will get a spring break after (laughs) Easter. Our offertory hymn this morning is 340. Calm ye sinners, poor and needy. Let us sing together all four stanzas. And let us stand, please, as we sing.
Let us pray. O oh God, we give out of what we have been given. The amount doesn't matter. The heart of the giver is what matters to you. You know our hearts and our treasures, and we give them both to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. 
But if not, you can cut it down. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful song that reminds us that we are journeying through Lent toward the cross of Calvary. And thank you, Cliff, for uh, reminding us of that old familiar hymn. Beautiful music today, and thank you for it. You know, I've always had a, a great love for biblical archaeology. And one of my greatest dreams is to go to the Holy Land on an archaeological dig and do it before I get too old and too decrepit to use a shovel. Over the years, I've enjoyed the, the works of uh, archaeologists like Dr. <coughs> Kathleen Kenyon, who was a scholar from the University of Oxford, and that's the one overseas in England. <laughs> Dr. Kenyon was best known for her techniques in excavation using modern techniques uh, in excavating the, the old biblical city of, of Jericho back in the 1950s. But my favorite biblical archaeologist is Dr. Charles Page. Now, some of you know Charlie and have traveled with him. Uh, Charlie is my favorite because he speaks my language. He's from Tennessee. And uh, once when I was in Jerusalem, he said in his slow southern drawl, Danny, I like it when you Mississippi folks come over here because y'all talk like I do. And I could understand that. Charlie has had a, a great influence on me and, and my study and therefore my preaching. He's written two books dealing with the Holy Land, one of them entitled Jesus and the Land and the other one 
entitled The Land and the Book. And I keep both of these close by within arm's length when I'm studying. Uh, I reach for them often to clarify a particular place or to learn more about a certain area in the Holy Land. And another reason I like Charlie Page is that he doesn't know it all. He does not know it all. And what I mean by that is that he doesn't feel like that he must answer all the hard questions that, that people offer him. During my first experience with, with Charlie uh, guiding a, a visit to the Holy Land, I stood as close by his side as I could at every opportunity because I realized right away he was much smarter than I and, and I wanted to learn as, as much as I could from him. I wanted to get my money's worth, so to speak. However, I soon discovered that, that when he was asked a very difficult question, he would often answer, I don't know. I don't know. Now, other guides that I had experienced in the Holy Land would always give an answer to your question, whether they knew the answer or not. They would always answer your question, but not Charlie. He knows his subject, and he knows his subject well. However, he's very quick to say, I don't know. I don't know. People are always asking hard questions, aren't they? One of the hardest questions that I find myself asking over the years is, why do good people do bad things? Why do good people do bad things? Throughout my ministry, I've come to know and love so many people, and, and I find that after having known someone for a while or for a long period of time, in one way or another, whether they tell me or, or I learn it in another way, I discover that they have done something very ridiculous. And I can't help but wonder, why? Why did they do that? Why do good people do bad things? Of course, another tough question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? People have always asked that question, haven't they? I suppose that that's the ultimate hard question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Chances are you've asked that question somewhere along the way. Why? Why, Why do bad things happen to good people? <coughs> Why does a hurricane hit the Gulf Coast, killing so many people and turning lives upside down and literally destroying the economy? Why? Why? Why does a tornado hit a small town in, in lower Alabama, destroying a school and, and killing school children and others and leaving the community bewildered and in turmoil? Why? Why? These are hard questions. And these were the type of questions that, that people were asking Jesus in our scripture for today. They reminded him of, of what must have been a, a recent news story. At least it was still on their minds. Some Galileans had, had been offered as human sacrifices by Pilate. It seems that a, a group of Jews had come down from Galilee, journeyed to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship. And as they offered their sacrifices to God, the soldiers of Pontius Pilate, who was then the Roman governor, killed them. And folks wondered, why? Why? Why did they have to die like that? Why, while they were worshiping in the temple, while they were offering to God blood sacrifices so that their blood would be mingled with their sacrifices that they offered to God? Why? Why? Hard questions. Hard questions. And then they offered an explanation. Well, sort of an explanation. Was it because... That they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans, they asked? No. No, said Jesus. But since you're talking about tragic stories, since you're talking about current events, how about those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? I suppose you think that, that they were worse sinners than all the rest in Jerusalem. No. 
No, he said, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. And then Jesus told a parable as a way of changing the subject, I suppose, <coughs> as a way of refocusing the crowd to change their thinking from hard questions to hard truths, from hard questions to hard truths. The truth was that they needed to be more concerned about what was right with themselves than what was wrong with others. They needed to be more concerned about the, the fact that time was running out. Time was running out for them if there was a need for them to repent and change their ways. Not hard questions, but hard truths. Hard truths. Maybe people ask hard questions because they just don't know what to say in the face of tragedy, and they feel like that they must say something. Dr. William Sloan Coffin was the senior pastor at the world-renowned Riverside Church in New York City, and, and while he was there, his son Alex was killed in an automobile accident during a, a terrible rainstorm, and the very next Sunday, Dr. Coffin preached and very openly talked about his son's death. And he thanked all the people there for their kind expressions, for their many messages, for their food, for the hugs when no words would really do. But also he raged. He, he raged about well-meaning people who hinted that, that his son's death was God's will. He said, do you think it was God's will that he never fixed that lousy windshield wiper? That he was probably driving too fast in such a storm as that? Do you think it was God's will that there were no lights on that stretch of road and no guardrails at all? And then he said, and I quote, one thing that should never be said when someone dies is, it is the will of God. Never do we know enough to say that. Wow, how powerful. Never do we know enough to say that. It's hard to let God be God, isn't it? It's so hard to let God be God. The parable Jesus told about the landowner who had a fig tree planted in what was about a, a landowner who had a fig tree that was planted in the vineyard. But after three years, the fig tree had produced no fig. So the landowner told the gardener, cut it down, cut it down. It's taking up space. It's wasting soil. However, the gardener had a soft spot in his heart for a fig tree, and he begged the landowner, give me one more year. Just, just give this tree one more year. Let me work it. Let me fertilize it, and let me till the soil around it. Then, if it doesn't produce fruit, you can cut it down yourself. Now, there's a mystery here. There's a mystery in this parable that Jesus tells us. We don't know what happened to the fig tree. We don't know the rest of the story. We're not told that. We don't know how the story ended. But my friends, we do know this. The lowly fig tree had a gardener that cared for it. And a gardener that was willing to work with it and nurture it in the way that it needed to be nurtured. And we also know that time for the fig tree to do what it was meant to do was running out. Time for the fig tree to produce fruit was running out. And this parable, I remind you, was Jesus' answer to the hard questions that people ask him. People are always asking hard questions, always, when, when actually there are more pressing matters at hand. Today's scripture is about repentance. That's right, repentance. That's what it's all about, repentance. In fact, Jesus said not once, but twice in, in these few verses of scripture, unless you repent, you will all perish. 
Did you happen to catch that? Did you happen to catch that right in the middle of the hard questions that, that that's what Jesus said? Folks were asking, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And right in the middle of that, Jesus said, you'd better repent. You had better repent. And then he, he told a parable about a gardener who loved a fig tree and a landowner who was willing to give it a little bit more time. I think this parable says to all of us, you need to repent. And you don't need to take forever to do it because time is running out. And, and please understand this. It's important that we understand that in this context, repentance means more than just changing our ways. It, it means more than that, more than being sorry for your sins. In this sense, repentance means changing your way, being sorry for your sins, and bearing good fruit, and doing what God wants you to do, doing what God put you on earth to do. Not taking up space in the vineyard or just taking up space in a pew. It means being involved in the ministry of our Lord and having something to show about it. Having something to show for it. However, it's a lot easier just to ask hard questions. Is it not? Why? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? Well, Jesus had, had dealt with this line of thinking before. And to me, ironically, it came from his own disciples, the very ones that he was mentoring to take his place when he was no longer around. In John chapter 9, we read, As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And then Jesus warns them, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We need to work while it's daylight because night is coming and no one can work at night. Do you hear that? Time is running out. Time is running out. And Jesus is, is once again implying this in the parable that we look at today. Time is running out. Now I'm convinced that, that one of the biggest fallacies in the minds of modern humanity today is that, that we have all the time that we need. That we have all the time with, that we need to, to, to make the needed changes in our lives. We know that, that there are changes that we meet, need to make and, and yet we think, well, I have plenty of time to do that. We, we reason that we have all the time that, it, that, that we need to make things right with our family or all the time that we need to make things right with our friends, to mend those relationships, or, or all the time we need to get things right with God. And my friends, that is a dangerous thought. That is a dangerous thing. I saw one of them the other day. Actually, I don't remember seeing one in quite some time. A brightly colored sign alongside the highway it said in big, bold letters, get right with God. And it certainly relays a sense of urgency, does it? You, you may have seen that sign from time to time. Get right with God. Now you have to admit that, that while you're driving down the highway at 55 miles an hour, plus or minus a few miles, and headed to wherever it is that, that you're headed, Someplace important, of course, because if you ever realize we're always headed to someplace important. Have you ever thought about that? But we are. We're, we're always headed to someplace important. And as we head down the highway, we see that roughly painted sign, get right with God. And there is that, that immediate sense of urgency. At least for a second or two, at least for a second or two, yet we live as though we have all the time left in the world. But Jesus said differently. We really don't have all the time in the world. Our time is running out. Once there was a couple who received a phone call telling them that they had won a, a two-week, all-expense-paid trip to Ireland. 
and they had always wanted to go to Ireland. And they were so excited. They had the whole year to make the trip so that they could fit it into their schedule just when they wanted to, and they were going to Ireland. But the wife thought about it and said, well, let's not do it this summer because we don't want to interfere with our summer at the lake. And we can't go in September because that's when the kids go back to school and we can't go then. And before they knew it, it was late October and the husband said, well, we can't go over the holidays. It would spoil the holidays here and we'll just have to wait and go the first of the year. And they agreed that that's what they would do. They would go at the first of the new year. However, someone told them that the days were terribly short in Ireland and January and February, and that the weather was hardly ever good during those months. And they said, well, we'll just wait till the springtime when we know that there's good weather and, and we don't have to worry about the, the snow closing the airports here in our country. So finally, they made their reservations for the first week in May, and man, were they excited. They were going to Ireland. They, they were going to have a good time. The weather was supposed to be good in Ireland at that time, and the days were long, and it was just the best time of the year to go. Now, they knew, they knew all along that they were cutting it very close, that their prize ran out June the 1st, but nothing would go wrong. They had it all planned, and they were excited. And then the husband had a gallbladder attack and had to have surgery, and the doctor said that he would be able to travel all by the middle of June. Does that not sound familiar? Does that not sound like us? We all seem to think that we have all the time in the world for whatever it is that, that we want to do. Yet Jesus says, you don't have forever. You don't have forever. God, like the gardener in this parable, has a soft spot for those who are not yet producing fruit. But even God will not wait forever. Can't you just hear the conversation between the landowner and the gardener there in the vineyard? The, the landowner walked into the vineyard and says, hey, that fig tree right over there is not producing figs and it's just taking up space. Cut it down. But, but the gardener says it was just planted just last year. It's just been planted one year. And then later, the landowner says, but it's been two years now and, and still no fruit. Cut it down. And, and the gardener says, but, but sir, it's still young. It's still young and tender. You have to wait. And then later, the landowner says, three years and there's no fruit at all. I've been patient. It's wasting space in the vineyard. Cut it down. And the gardener says, please, sir, let me work with it. Let me work with it. Let me do all that I can with it. It will produce fruit. But, but if it doesn't, then you can cut it down yourself. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of God's grace. And what a beautiful picture of a gardener's hope. And what a beautiful picture of a fig tree's promise. But even then, you can only go so far. Time does run out. It, it really does. Time does run out. I suppose we will always have the hard questions. Hard questions like, why? Why? Why do good people do bad things? Or why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. I really don't know. If I did, if I knew the answer to questions like that, I would have the answer to the million dollar question, wouldn't I? But my friends, I do know this. We must all repent. And we don't have forever to do it. Our hymn of invitation is number 121. There's a wideness in God's mercy, and there really is a wideness in God's mercy. God, like, like the loving gardener, gives us opportunity after opportunity. I challenge you as we sing this closing hymn together, consider your time, consider your needs, and do the things that God calls you to do. Would you not do that as we stand and sing together?
of worship, remembering the wide love of God, but remembering the time that we have too to be the people that God calls us to, to be, to produce the fruit that we should produce here on earth. Go in peace in the name of Jesus. May the